Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. My name is Nick Hayes, and I am delighted to serve as your worship associate today and to welcome you fully into this space. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies here. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit here. We welcome all you are bringing with you today and all your heart longs to settle down, to set down. We extend a special welcome to each guest among us. We invite guests to fill out a welcome card located in the pew rack in front of you and drop it off in the offering plate later in the service. Guests may also pick up a welcome packet at the back of the sanctuary where folks will also find hearing assist devices and braille hymnals. A fragrance free location is located on the, on the front right side in the first few peers, pews. If you are a visiting family, including children or youth, after the time for all ages noted in your order of service, please join the children's recessional and head across the hall to the common room. There you will be greeted by someone who will orient you to religious education. And immediately following the service, everyone is invited for coffee and conversation in the common room. My name is Nick Hayes, and you can come talk to me at the guest table there. As a way to engage at First Church, I invite everyone to explore the announcements inserted for the numerous, I should say numerous, opportunities available here. In particular, let me draw your attention to these. Today is the last day to sign up for Adult Our Whole Lives, OWL, Fall Class on Gender and Sexual Orientation. Class begins Wednesday, October 9th. Stop by the religious education table today during coffee hour in the Lean House common room or sign up online. Today is the last day to register for theme circles. Theme circles are small groups that meet once a month to support the journey of reconnection to life, to others, and to ourselves through reflection on our monthly worship themes. You can find more information and register on our website. Join us next weekend for the Mortar Lectures Weekend of Singing and Protest. Singer-songwriter Sarah Thompson will be with us on Thursday through Sunday teaching us how to build a community that sings for social justice. On Thursday, October 3rd, drop in for one rehearsal with our choir in order to sing with Sarah at worship on Sunday, October 6th. Attend a private concert with Sarah on October 4th, that's Friday, and then attend the Mortar Lecture on Saturday, October 5th, and learn from Sarah how to use singing to build community and resist oppression. Finally, come to the singing workshop after church on October 6th, that's Sunday, to learn and sing social justice songs. You can pick up a flyer with details of all of the events at the social justice table in the common room or learn more on our website. And one last announcement. Our immigration action team invites you to the Vosis de la Frontera at the Fire and Police, Commi Police Committee's meeting this Thursday, October 3rd at 4.30 p.m. to show that the, that the Milwaukee community welcomes immigrants and opposes collaboration between the Milwaukee Police Department and ICE. You can pick up a flyer with more details at the social justice table in the common room today. Please find details on these and more announcements in the announcements insert. Finally, it is not rude to take this out and turn it off now. Please silence any electronic devices for the remainder of the service. Once again, I welcome you to First Church by inviting you to join me in the unison reading of our mission, which is printed in your order of service. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let me now call up Frank and Miles Kanabi, who will help light our chalice. Our opening words this morning are by the Reverend Gretchen Haley. Because the tides are rising, so must we rise to this moment, to this day, 
to this life, to this place in the web that is yours and ours. We must rise because the earth remains our only home. And we, fellow travelers, are only hope for healing and wholeness. Before the mystery, before the Big Bang that started it all, this infinite universe that still takes notice of us, still feels the in and out of our breath, still holds us, connects us. Rise or surrender with gratitude for this beauty, this chance to be part of it all, to give back, to weave life, past, present, and future, everywhere, always, one. Come, let us worship together. And will you rise in body? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm here this morning to tell you about a great opportunity uh, at, here at First Church this year, but this is a limited time offering and space is limited, so listen up. There are still a couple of spots. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. Um, a great opportunity here, but it's a limited time offer and it is, uh, has limited space. So there, Jennifer tells me this week that there are still a couple of spots available on the Pledge Drive team for this year. Woo really? <laughs> uh, Timothy Snyder's little book that offers 20 lessons from the 20th century about how citizens can prevent or resist a slide into tyranny uh, is a wonderful little book and the context is a little different, of course, but every time I read his lesson number two, I think about this church. His lesson number two says we must defend institutions. He says you should choose an institution you care about, a court, a newspaper, a law, a labor union, a church, and take its side. And what really grabbed my attention in that lesson was this. He said, it is institutions that help us to preserve decency, but they need our help as well. I believe that this church, this congregation, is one of those institutions which helps us preserve decency. And of course, it does so much more than that. Perhaps most importantly, it offers us possibilities for transformation. Linda and I joined First Church 12 years ago this fall, and three months later, I was recruited to help out with some pledge drive activities. 
The following year, I joined the stewardship team and eventually became its co-chair. And in the end, I served six years there. And that experience transformed my life. I came to believe that it was less about just asking for pledges and more about reminding folks to pause and give themselves the space to remember why they came here and how being a part of this community might have transformed their own lives in ways large or small. And believe me, when people tell you the stories of how they came to join this church and why they've stayed here, you will hear the most amazing and inspiring stories. And hearing those stories will be part of what transforms you. First Church has been here for 177 years, which I think qualifies it as a Milwaukee institution. There's no doubt it helps us preserve all that is good and decent in our lives and our community. And as Snyder's lesson number two reminds us, it needs your help as well. So take advantage of this limited time opportunity and talk to Lynn Jacoby or Fred Gutierrez, and I'll be around in coffee hour if you'd like to talk to me too. Thanks. A number of years ago, as a relatively new congregation member, I was asked to join the pledge team. I said yes. In hindsight, I had very little idea what I was getting involved in, but dove into learning and service. Over my time working on the team, I developed an intimate understanding of how to sustain this incredible and unique community. I learned a tremendous amount about collaborative leadership and transformative relationships. I built strong friendships with a variety of other members across age, personality, and interest. Perhaps most importantly, being on the pledge team fundamentally changed my relationship with money and how I perceive value. Everyone here loves this community for different reasons. For me, diving in and working in an area critical to our sustainability while building my own understanding of how a faith community operates allowed me to express love. It enabled me to bring my skills and experience to advance this community and work to ensure it will thrive and be resourced for generations to come. I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve and am a better person because of it. The stewardship teams of this congregation, including the pledge team, are actively seeking to build long-term, sustainable, and meaningful ways of connecting with and supporting our community. We see generosity as a spiritual practice and leadership as a shared responsibility. So if you want to get in on this life-changing opportunity that Dale and Tony talked about, and be part of the stewardship of the congregation for all of us. Please talk to our membership and development coordinator, Lynn Jacoby, or our pledge drive chair, Fred Gutierrez, at the membership table during coffee hour today. Now will you please rise in either body or spirit to join in our...
You may be seated. I am delighted to share with you the news of a new baby in our congregation. Andy Cinco and Lizzie Anderson welcomed their first child into the world on Friday the 13th of September, which was also the day of the full moon. Baby Joshua Trevor Cinco arrived at 4 p.m., weighing 6 pounds and 15 ounces. He and his parents are doing well. Are they here today? Why don't you rise? Yes, welcome. <laughs> Thus, as is our tradition in this church, whenever we have a birth, an adoption, or a death among our members, we light our candle of life today in honor of Joshua Trevor Cinco. I'd like to invite you to join me now in a time of contemplation, which will be followed by silence, followed by the seated singing of Spirit of Life. So just take a minute to find yourself in your pew or your chair. Feel your body. Let your sit bones and your feet ground you. and the top of your head connect you to all that is. And let your breath moving in and out bring you into being here and now. Spirit of life and love, Holy One of our being and our becoming, that which is sacred within, among, and beyond us. Help us settle into the strangeness of time. Time which bends and distorts. Time which affects our perception and behavior. May we know time's arrow. Ride out its fickle ways. And surrender to its truths. May we make the most of the time we have as we are unable to see the future and just guessing at the present. May we make the best of this precious moment in which we live. May it be so.
I have clear memories from between the ages of seven and 20 of wanting more than anything to be 21 years old. Like the now bankrupt retailer Forever 21, I had soaring expectations for that year. I was certain that the age would confirm all that needed confirming. I would know who I was, what I was going to be, and where I was going to be, and let me tell you, the sky was the limit. I would be mysterious, well-traveled, well-read, and academic, of course. I would be athletic and artistic and adventurous and wise just because. I would be a pilot or a politician or a spy. <laughs> Maybe all three. I would certainly, I thought, be independent. And of course, none of those things came true. In fact, the year passed without fanfare, and all I recall from it is deflation and dependency and fear. And while I had the privilege of an understandably concerned but loving family, I had positioned myself, just as adulthood was coming on, to be unqualified for, well, everything. That had an immediate and chilling effect on big plans and over-the-top expectations. A partner appeared. Many of you know Angela. And we pooled our remaining youth into a relationship based on the only things we knew to do at the time. One rooted essentially in laughter and listening and applause. We didn't know it at the time, but we had intuitively focused on the basics when times were uncertain. So with the reasonable expectation of mutually assured fundamental needs met, the next three and a half decades became a kind of trial and error free for all. Go for it. Give it your best shot. What's the worst that can happen? And in this way, we stumbled into ways to feed ourselves and to study and learn, to make room for play, to explore, sidestep pitfalls, hurt and heal, and to parent. Eventually, especially through the parenting, a visceral sense of purpose formed. That purpose now informs a new kind of expectation, but one with no deadline. I'm sad but also gratified to report that this was confirmed just this year. Let me explain. Angela's dad, Robert Bob Wozniak, recently passed away, too young, 70. A cough turned into a stage four lung cancer diagnosis with maybe a year left. The minute he learned, he opened his calendar and packed it full with lazy afternoons and long dinners with friends and family, a kind of goodbye tour. He sang and he sailed and he held hands with his grandkids. Didn't complain, didn't panic, didn't regret. Instead, he did the things he knew to do. He laughed and he listened and he applauded. He did the basics when time became uncertain because he expected the love to live on. Our job now is to make certain that his expectations are met.
What is by now evident and clear is that neither future nor past exists. And it is inexact language to speak of three times, past, present, and future. Perhaps it would be exact to say there are three times, a present of things past, a present of things present, and a present of things to come. In the soul, there are these three aspects of time, and yet I do not see them anywhere else. The present considering the past is memory. The present considering the present is immediate awareness, and the present considering the future is expectation. That was St. Augustine, the North African theologian and church father writing in his fifth century autobiographical work of theology, Confessions. Augustine was what is called a presentist, someone who believes that only the present moment truly exists. He believed that the soul exists in this present moment and then considers, projects, thoughts of both the past and the future. However, while Augustine would argue that only the present is real, the multiple states of the present still affect one another. The present, considering the past, affects present awareness and behavior, as does the present, considering the future. For in considering the past, for instance, a person might remember an experience with a bear and make choices to avoid bears in current behavior. In considering the future, a person might have expectations that the earth would continue to include sunlight and food and other things on whose stability a person has come to depend. In the novel, A God in Ruins, author Kate Atkinson writes about how a person in the present considering the future is changed by expectations of time. The main character in the novel, Teddy, is a young man who at the beginning of World War II enlists as a pilot in the Royal Air Force of Britain. The chances of him surviving are slim. Teddy moves into a space of suspended expectation and living fully present in the now because he stops expecting to have a future. Before the war began, Teddy had expected to marry his sweetheart Nancy and, quote, move to a pleasant suburb, have those inevitable children, and work his way up in the bank. But unfortunately for Teddy, his expectations of a full and comfortable life did not feel like freedom. Rather, he felt like the future was a cage closing in around him. And then, on the day that Britain declared war, Teddy, quote, realized that the cage doors were opening, the prison bars were falling away. He was about to be freed from the shackles of banking and the prospect of suburbia, and children, and marriage. Because Teddy did not expect to survive the war, he just lived day to day. War itself was hell. Afterwards, his memory of it was just, quote, a jumble of random in images that haunted his sleeping self the Alps in the moonlight, a propeller blade, a face pale in the water. Teddy was captured after being shot down over Nuremberg on the worst night of the war for the Royal Air Force when Britain lost almost 100 planes and over 500 men. However, even though the war was Teddy's recurring nightmare, 
quote, he had been reconciled to death during it. And when suddenly the war was over and there was a next day and a next day and a next day, part of him never adjusted to having a future. When he returned home, he saw the future unraveling before him day after dismal day. Saw himself dutifully earning money to support Nancy and their as yet unborn children who were already weighting him down with responsibility. Saw himself, too, on the day he finally retired, a disappointed man. It was the bank all over again. Nick just told us a story about how his father-in-law's expectation of death released him into living a life expecting love rather than greatness, expecting daily life to be more important than an unfolding future. Time narrowing expectations can increase the experience of the present and help people prioritize what it is that really matters. Time's telescope can create opportunities to pay attention and choose the most important things in the present moment. What expectations do you have about your future? And what expectations do we have collectively about ours? Last Friday, September 20th of 2019, youth from around the world led a worldwide climate strike for their future, calling on world leaders to take action now so that they might have one. It was initially called by Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old Swedish girl who began striking for the climate a year ago, sitting alone on the ground outside of the Swedish parliament with a sign that read, School Strike for Climate. Soon after, other young people began their own climate strikes around the world, and they started organizing school climate strikes together, calling them Fridays for Future. Just a year later, Thurnberg was speaking to the United Nations as she and 15 other young people, including leaders like American Latina Alexandria Villasenor and indigenous Alaskan Carl Smith, petitioned under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, arguing that the lack of action on climate violates their fundamental right to a future, to health and life and peace. I am so grateful for the courageous leadership of these young people and I will follow them also calling on our leaders to prevent the worst threats of climate change. We are in the last few years of being able to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees Celsius and have just a couple of decades to limit it to two degrees Celsius. Beyond that, Scientists estimate that we'll be on a path to runaway global climate change with feedback loops that we will not be able to stop. When I think about my future and our collective future, I don't really expect it to look like the world that we live in now. But I also don't really expect it to not look like the world that we live in now, because I've never lived in any other world. My history and my past experience is predisposing me to expect a future that mirrors those experiences of my past. My present self 
Considering my past and my future is rather unreasonably expecting some sort of similarity between them, even though my neocortex understands entropy and aging and climate science and the human rates of change. My brain is working against itself. Brains can be like that sometimes. In the book Scale, author Jeffrey West gives an example of an exponential process to illustrate how bad our brains are at understanding exponential processes, especially when those processes involve time. So he gives us an, an imaginary experiment in which we fill a container full of bacteria and we want it to get full in exactly four hours between 8 a.m. and noon. So in this imaginary experiment, we begin with one single bacterium at the bottom of the container. And that bacterium splits and therefore doubles itself every minute, reproducing exponentially. So after one minute, we have two bacteria. And after two minutes, we have four bacteria, and so on, up the exponential curve of time. So I ask you, friends, in this thought experiment, at what time between 8 a.m. and noon would the container be halfway full. Eight. One minute before noon. More guesses. Eight oh five. It would be half full one minute before noon. Because in one minute, it would double itself to become completely full. What expectations do you have about your future? What expectations do we collectively have about ours? My colleague, the Reverend Molly Hausch Gordon of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbia, Missouri, last week preached a climate strike sermon, How to Survive the End of the World, in which she argued that we have to find a way to turn quickly away from an extractive economy to what the organizing group, the movement generation, calls the regenerative economy. The current economic system is built on extraction and production processes that are not only killing us, but they are killing everything around us. We're facing a mass extinction, what Elizabeth Colbert calls the sixth extinction in her 2014 book by that name. Our lives depend on learning how to turn this ship around. Reverend Gordon quoted Greta Thunberg's April speech to the British Parliament in which she said, avoiding climate breakdown will require cathedral thinking. We must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly yet how to build the ceiling. And yet, we must do it anyway. Sometimes we simply have to find a way. Many people avoid talking about climate change because the problem feels too massive or the changes required feel too big. But cathedral thinking can also be gorgeous. And our great cities and beautiful old cathedrals and mass movements show us that human beings are capable of that kind of thinking. And not just that kind of thinking, but also that kind of action. If you did not expect a future that was defined by the routines of extractive economy success, 
if what is before us does not look like what is behind us, if the time is shorter than you think, what would you do? What would matter to you the most? What would your priorities be? Joanna Macy wrote, let's drop the notion that we can manage our planet for our comfort or our profit, or even that we can now be its ultimate redeemers because it is a delusion. Let's accept in its place the radical uncertainty of our time, even the uncertainty of survival. The truth is, we do not know what the future holds. We do not know if we will win this war, or if Teddy, or you, or I will survive it. Still, I say that we are the lucky ones. We are lucky because we have the privilege of being alive right now, at this moment in history where we can make choices that will make the difference between the future of life on this planet. We don't only owe it to the children, we owe it to ourselves, to life and love in here and now to serve that life, to give the whole a chance of surviving. Time is a weird thing. A fourth coordinate on the map of the universe that does not function in the same way as space. And because of that, we can't know the future. All we can know is the present, and in this present moment, choose to be human expressions of love for what is now and what might become. The bad thing about climate change is that it is about everything. It's about economics and race and gender and nationality and migration and democracy and consumption and production and food and waste and water and that fickle and infinitely complex but clearly climate changing thing we call the weather. It is about the processes of life and death of everything on this planet and moving those processes from an extractive system to a regenerative system. So of course people feel overwhelmed. It's everything. But another way to think about it is that that is what's good about working to prevent climate change because it's about everything so you can get in where you fit in. What we need now is mass mobilization, people all over the world organizing where they are and where they are called to work. Climate change is a collective problem, which means it needs collective solutions. We need a price on carbon full stop right now, period. But we also need democratic control of our institutions, healthy and trusting relationships across difference, equitable processes for climate migrants and refugees, local food production and distribution, clean and safe drinking water for all people, the list goes on and on. It could be overwhelming, or it could be a long list of opportunity for you to go where you are called and work there locally, right now, doing the good and loving work of playing the part you are called to play in shifting the system at this moment in history. In A God in Ruins, Kate Atkinson is writing about another moment in history when people felt like they were living in apocalypse, the apocalypse of World War II. In that novel, Teddy's sister tells him 
we can only ever be walking into our future. Best foot forward and all that. Atkinson continues, this was when people still believed in the dependable nature of time, a past, a present, and a future, the tenses that Western civilization was constructed on. Over the coming years, Teddy tried, in the manner of a simple layman, to keep up with theoretical physics. Via articles in the Telegraph and an heroic struggle with Stephen Hawking in 1996, but Teddy admitted defeat when he came across string theory. From then on, he took every day as it came, hour by hour. Maybe time is telescoping for us now in this strange moment of history's pressure for an uncertain future. May we take this unknown and unknowing and turn it into acts of love for now and for what is to come, getting in where we fit in, organizing the shift in our small piece of changing the world. May it be so.
Will you please rise and body or spirit for our responsive reading, which is excerpted from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Walkimer. I'll begin. Action on behalf of life. Because the relationship between self and the world it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved. For as we work to heal the earth, will you join in our closing hymn?